twos are for, you can't read them from out in the pews there, they say happy birthday. And the balloons and flowers are in dedication of Pastor Jim's birthday. Um, yeah. 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 His official birthday is October 4th, so you can wow. for him for another wonderful year. Um, wanted to give you just a few announcements. I know that all our announcements are in their bulletin, but we like to highlight a few of the things that are happening. Second Sunday on the patio, we're not done yet. We have one more um, on October next week. You're going to want to join us after worship on the night on the patio. If it's raining or, or cold, we'll figure it out. So come no matter what, rain or shine. And this time we're having donuts from Detroit. Maybe donuts, correct? So we're going to have donuts and cider and coffee, and I'll be there. <laughs> we also have our Fall Family Fun Fest coming up, and that is on October 16th from 4 to 6 p.m. We'll have inflatables, the corn pit to play in, games, food, animals, and all are welcome to attend. We hope to see everyone there. It's going to be a wonderful day. It always is, um, so I can't wait for that to happen. Charge Conference. It is that time of year again for those of us at church that understand what that is. Charge Conference. Our church charge conference, uh, conference will be held on October 30th at noon right here in the sanctuary. So October 30th at noon here in the sanctuary. And Trick or Treat is coming. And I don't know if you know this or not, but on Halloween, we do hand out candy as a church. So we make um, what we call the Christian pumpkin patch. So it's just all happy, smiling pumpkins that kiddos can come and walk through and get some candy. So what we would like is if you could give us some donations of individually wrapped candies, we can use those to hand out. Last year, we had about 150 kids come through. So if you don't give out candy at your house and you want to come and sit with us and see all the wonderful costumes and the excitement of all those little kids, I think that's a fun time of year. We're always so, so excited. You are welcome to come and join us. And offering, as always, we give you thanks for the ways that you um, partner with God and minister here at Perrysburg First. If you brought offering here today, you can uh, leave it in person. There's an offering box in the upper narthex. You can go online and give, or you can mail it in. So friends, take a moment and say hello and introduce yourself to someone around you. Maybe tell them what your favorite thing about fall is. <laughs> presence with thanksgiving. If today you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but together lift them up. If today you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Come, bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us. Today you will hear his voice. Worship, worship him with singleness of heart and mind. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord remains forever. Please remain standing for our hymn of response.
Well, we've changed order up a little bit uh, in your bulletin. Uh, we've done some adjusting this week. We had hurricane stuff going on, uh, some folks that were stranded for a while. Uh, and uh, Betsy printed the bulletins early because she got married and was on our honeymoon. Yeah. So communion, yeah, celebrate that. So communion got moved a little bit earlier. So we're going to move now and celebrate communion together. And today is World Communion Sunday. So that's exciting because we are celebrating communion uh, with churches all around the globe today. And not only from United Methodist uh, churches, but all denominations uh, around the globe. So we all join together this one Sunday of the year, uh, unified, celebrating uh, communion together. So it's a great thing when we all come together and share in this meal. Um, and as we come, uh, we always remember this is a means of grace. It's a moment where God works in our life, where God meets with us in this time that he comes and he imparts his very, uh, his very life to us as we join together in this way. And we just want you to know that communion in the United Methodist Church is open to anyone that's seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member here to participate. So if you're a guest with us today, uh, we invite you uh, to join and share in this meal with us as well. Jesus is our host and it's his table and he invites all to come that desire a relationship uh, with him. So I encourage you, uh, you received the little elements as you came in, just hold those till the end and I'll, I'll tell you when to open those as we uh, proceed with uh, this part of our service. So as the invitation, just hear this, that Christ our Lord, our Lord excuse me, invites to his table all of those who love him and all those that seek to grow with him into his likeness. So let us come, draw near with faith, make our humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament of bread and cup. And so I invite you to join me uh, in these words of confession uh, this morning. So most merciful and gracious God, we your church confess that our spirit has not been that of Christ. Where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him, forgive us, we pray. May your grace and mercy be more than enough to meet our every need. By your spirit, make us faithful to live more fully in response to your love and free us for joyful obedience. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I invite you this morning to believe the good news. Because in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, and it's a good, it's a joyful thing, always and everywhere, when we give thanks to you, Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth, and as we join with them today around the globe in the company of heaven, we come now to praise your name, and we join in their unending hymn of praise, as we say together, Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the last night he spent uh, with his disciples on earth, he gathered them together to share in a meal. And that night he took the bread, he broke it, and gave thanks to his Father. And he said to the disciples, and he says to us here today, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, uh, Jesus took a cup. It was the third cup of the meal that night. 
That cup was known as the cup of redemption. And Jesus held it up. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, given for you and poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this now as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so God, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to you now in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we now join together to proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us that are gathered here today and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, we ask that you would make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us now join together in the prayer he taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you would go ahead and grab your communion elements. And friends, Jesus, the one who was whole, gave himself, allowed himself to be broken so that we who are broken might become whole through him. So this is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. And friends, Jesus, the one who was full, emptied himself so that we who are empty might be filled through him. So this is the blood of Christ that was given for you. Take and drink. Amen. Let me pray for us. It's almighty and gracious God. God, we give you thanks for the world that you have created. We give you thanks for the gift of life that we enjoy and for giving yourself fully to us in your son, Jesus Christ. And it's his holy life, suffering and death and glorious res resurrection that has delivered us from slavery to sin and death. We thank you that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you have met with us here today and you've fed us in the sacrament of bread and cup. And at doing so, you've united us with Christ and granted us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet that is to come. So we ask now that you would continue to meet with us here today. God, reveal to us your great love, your mercy, and your grace, and then empower us to respond to you and receive these gifts into our own life. Come and make us one in spirit and in voice as we continue to offer you our worship here today. We are your children, and yours is the glory now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
pastor's own staff. And thank you uh, for the birthday. Flowers and balloons and all this stuff. Uh, you know, they come around every year. After a while, they just end up being another day pretty much. But thank you for taking the time uh, to do that. And I want to say hello to our folks on, on uh, Facebook today that are joining us uh, via our live stream. Glad that you're here as well. And uh, just a heads up, I am on vacation this week. I'll uh, be gone all week and through next weekend. Uh, Amy and I are going to Paris, um, Kentucky. <laughs> so, it's a different Paris, but it's still Paris. <laughs> See, I, I think I couldn't let you stay with that too long. <laughs> yeah. It's not quite the same, but it'll still be really nice. We, uh, we've got a a bed and breakfast on a horse farm there, a working horse farm, so that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Hanging out. <laughs> yeah, I I couldn't let that get away, right? Coming down to Paris. <laughs> so but it's uh yeah, it's just the time that you know we do vacation and um as you know we've come through a, a rough couple months and I should let you know we lost another person this week. Uh Ramona Mercer passed away Thursday and her funeral will be uh, this coming Thursday here. Uh, there's, and I'm gone. So they have a friend that's also a pastor that knows him really well that happens to be in town. So uh, he'll, he'll be handling the funeral on Thursday. It'll be here at the church, but uh, Thursday morning at 10 a.m., just in case you'd like to come and pay respects to Ramona. And uh, so that's seven in uh, the last, I think, nine weeks that we have lost. So this could stop any time. Yeah. Let's just be real. But uh, just to let you know, I will be gone all week, but Jody will be here. Betsy's back, and uh, but we continue to lift up those in our congregation and their families that have uh, passed and we've lost lately. So, but today, um, well, that I just want to go ahead and kind of jump into things uh, in our series we've been in called "Why Church," and the whole premise of this whole series was based on why why do we do church? Why do we gather on Sundays? Why do we? Uh, join a church, become members? Why do we give ourselves to actively being a part of a congregation? Why church? Can't I just love Jesus and you know not be a part? Well, that's kind of what we've been trying to, I think that's a false narrative that's out there, uh, that's around, and we'll talk about a little bit of that later, but we kind of wanted to talk about why we do church, why do we worship, why do we do things like communion? You were here last week, Laura did such a great job uh, walking us through why we do communion. Uh, and today I want to talk about, and this is something I'm very passionate about. You know, for my first 10 or 12 years of ministry, my role was known as a connection pastor. That was my title. I was, my first, my first job, I was the pastor of community and connections. That does not fit well on a business card. It's way too long. <laughs> so they abbreviated to something even worse. But we just said it was pastor of connection. So uh, I'm very passionate about it. I preached on it here before. I will probably again and again, because I think it's just something, a story, a, a narrative we need to be reminded of all the time, because um, we just forget about it sometimes and we, we go on. But I, I wanted to start today, though. I want to share with you a story. It's a true story. Um, it, it was a scene Amy and I happened upon one day. So at the time, we were living in Kentucky, not Paris, um, but Wilmore, Kentucky. It's where Asbury Seminary is. It's a little town outside of Lexington, about 15, 20 miles uh, down along uh, 68. And uh, so one morning, we were heading. We had an appointment uh, in Nicholasville or somewhere, our county seat. We were heading uh, out of town on one of the country roads, which is all you really get around Wilmore. If you've ever been there, it's all country roads. But the road's called uh, Jessamine Station is the name of the road. And as we're driving, there was a small farm that had always been there and we passed all the time, but this farm always had llama in the field. Now, were they llama or alpacas? I don't know. I think there were llama. I'm not gonna get close enough to tell the difference. And uh, which by the way, we may or may not have llama at the fall fest if you're here last week. They may be in the petting zoo, they may not be. But there are these llama in the field and, but this morning it was different because there's this, there's this whole drama that's playing out in the field. So it's the weirdest thing, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. So they're standing side by side, lined up next to each other, where four or five 
llama, and they're all lined up in a row. And directly across from them, about 10, maybe 15 yards away, was a lone coyote. And so it was this classic standoff, this face-off happening. Here was this coyote who clearly had big dreams, right? I mean, little, little coyote and lined up across were these five or whatever llama. And they're squared off. And you can tell they have come together to make a stand. And I'm thinking this coyote's thinking, I just want lunch. I just want dinner. <laughs> but the thing that fascinated me was is how united these llama were. I've never seen anything like this. Again, all lined up right next to each other because they knew, I think they knew one thing. It was the best for their collective group, for this, you know, this little llama community. It was the best thing they had to do if they were going to win this because the coyote had one goal, right? It was to isolate one of them from the rest because coyotes aren't dumb. They know if they can isolate you from your pack, they have a chance to overcome. This is the only hope for dinner. Now, you know, we couldn't stop and watch how this all played out, but we came back later and clearly it was over. It was a couple hours later. So it was all done. The coyote was gone. Llamas were back doing their llama thing in this field. And uh, it, if I were there, I guess probably what happened was this. After a while, the coyote finally just gave up. Like, well, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'll go somewhere else and find some less daunting kind of prey to get my lunch snack. Um, but that scene, though, always uh, stuck in my mind because it was so weird, so bizarre. I've never seen anything like it. But it came back to mind this week as I was, I was working on this message, uh, thinking and working about uh, why community? Why do we need to be connected with each other in this life of faith? Um, why are we truly better together when we join together in this way. And I, I want to read a passage today. I think it touches on this. There's so much you can choose from to speak to this, but I just want to use this one today to kind of highlight for us. Uh, one of the things I think is important for us as we uh, join together in community. It comes out of Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to start with verse 23 because it leads into uh, the why part of it. So the writer says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider then how we may spur, and this word spur, uh, it, it means to kind of jab or poke, so that it kind of um, moves you to respond. So I don't know if you have anyone ever poked you in the ribs a little bit. It's kind of that idea, so it's this jabbing, the spurring, so you'll respond to it. To one another, uh, toward love and good deeds. And he goes on and says, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And, and this kind of means to come, it's kind of what happened there in the field, to come alongside another person, to walk next to them, right? Kind of what played out in that field uh, with the llama. You come alongside and that's how you encourage one another. We do that all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, I read this because I strongly believe that this is a word that we, that the church, really need, that we need to take to heart today. I know in my own life, I can look back, uh, I need this kind of community. I need someone that's there to, to really work to spur me on, right? I need trusted friends uh, to encourage me in my walk, and, and not just so that they're doing it for me, but also that I'm doing it for them, right? It's, it's a give and take is how it works itself out. Uh, I know I'm better for it. Uh, I found that it's in those kind of relationships over all the years that I have been a Christian that my faith has been worked out. That's where it works itself out in relationship with other people in those kinds of settings. Uh, those are the places where I've experienced uh, my greatest times of growth. That's been true for 30 years. I can think back over the years, all the different groups Amy and I have been a part of, um, a prayer group I was a part of on Tuesday morning, uh, the small groups we were a part of, different groups I was in at seminary, 
uh, with other students. Uh, a group I'm in that, and now that we meet every Monday where we encourage one another. We do what Jody talked about uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago when we, act, we actually come together and we confess our sins to each other. We hold one another accountable uh, each and every week and then we pray for each other. It's a very, um, a very vulnerable group, but I've grown more in the last four months from that group than I have in years. Uh, just because of what happens there in the, in the openness that we share. Because uh, when things are brought out into the light, they no longer have power over you. When you keep them hidden in darkness, they keep you in bondage. So we need that. We need to speak some of these things out into the light. Again, this is just critical for us today. And it's especially true, I shared this statistic a couple weeks ago, since we've seen this alarming decline in church attendance the last um, 20 plus years. It's just been a decline, um, you know, across at least this part of the globe. The church is growing in other areas. It's funny how the church grows where there's persecution um, most of the time. And we see decline where there's comfort. It's kind of funny how that works itself out. But uh, you, I, just, I guess, you know, when you're desperate, that's when people are really hungry. That's when the church really grows when people are being persecuted. But George Gallup, and I've shared this uh, before with you all, but he, he conducts uh, this group. He has a Gallup poll. And they do a lot of surveys around faith and items of faith. But back in 2016, they were doing a survey, and he came away and he made this statement. He said, Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. Now, I still find that hard to imagine, right? We have all these different ways uh, to connect with each other, especially now via social media. So we have this list them all. We have Instagram, we have Facebook. We, we can still, some people still tweet. I think it's kind of gone down. We text. Heck, we can still call people on the phone even, right? Occasionally people still write letters and cards. You know, I got a card this week in the mail. So we have all these ways to connect, but the sad reality is this, that the research is showing us that at least in our culture here in the United States, that we feel more alone than ever. <laughs> and let's be honest, the last two years haven't helped that, right? With COVID? For how many months? We're not even really supposed to be out of our house. Uh, and so that didn't help at all. Um, there's another author, uh, I've read some of his stuff, and he suggests this, and I would agree with him, that he says that people's most basic need in life is relationship. Uh, he says the clear teaching of the New Testament is that the body of Christ is to be people deeply connected to each other other. I'll just think about that. That's the clear teaching of the New Testament, that we should be deeply connected to each other. He goes on to say this. I'll throw it up on the screen. He says, by inviting people into relationship with others in the church, we are taking the next step in giving them the best possible opportunity to become fully developing followers of Christ. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say by inviting them to programs or inviting them to events. Although those are good things, right? Those are uh, they, they're vehicles. They serve as a bridge into connection, being connected. But the real key is inviting people into relationship with others in the church, with us. You know, I've shared a little bit of my own story, but my entrance into uh, the faith happened through relationships I had built with some guys I played racquetball with at the YMCA during the week. That's how I got connected to a church. It wasn't, I didn't walk in a door. I, these guys invited me into relationship. They shared their life with me first. And then through an invitation, I started to come uh, attend a church where they attended. It started first though with the relationship. So that's what we're inviting people to. So the underlying suggestion premise here is this, that our faith is truly, it's best formed in community, in relationship with one another, doing life together, joining, sharing, praying with one another, talking about our faith. Yes, we can talk about our faith. It's about what God does in that process as he works to shape us, to mold us into the people and into people who are more caring, who are more compassionate, and who are more alive in our faith. 
Make sense? That's how our faith gets worked out. Our personal faith, it's always worked out in relationship, in community with other people. It's not my idea. It's not the idea that someone in the church came up with. In fact, you go back to the first chapter of Genesis, you find out the why of this. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. So um, God's in the process of creating, and he comes and he says this. He says, then God said, let us make human beings in our own image, in our likeness. And then jumping down to 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And so he says, I'm going to make, I'm going to make people in my image. I'm going to stamp a part of myself on them. I'm going to imprint part of my very nature into these people I'm creating, a likeness, the image of who I am. And when you look at God, and we know God as a Trinitarian God, that's the theological word, what is the nature of God? What's at the center of God's nature? It's community. It's relationship. It's the Father, it's the Son, and the Holy Spirit living together in community. See, community flows from who God is. Uh, and it's such a beautiful thing that he knows that he just wanted to share it with us. He wanted us to enjoy it too because God is a gracious, he's a giving God, and he wants to bless us with good things. So he invited us to share in community. It's part of his image stamped on our lives. It's part of our DNA, defines us. So again, I've got a slide for this. Community begins with, it originates from God. It's foundational to our understanding of faith. It's just at the heart of it. Now, I mentioned this earlier. In case someone here is thinking, well, that's, that's well and good. That sounds great. It's, real, it's great information to know. Thank you. I know something better now. I'll go home. You know, we can go to Bob Evans and, and get breakfast and go. But I don't really need community to follow Jesus, to love Jesus. I can do fine. I don't need other people. Just me and Jesus. Jesus and I are good. Haven't you heard that? I've heard it before. We've heard it many times. I just need Jesus. Just me and Jesus. We can do fine. Friends, let me ask you this. What happens when that coyote comes? Who is there to come alongside you? Who is there to encourage you? Who is there to spur you on? Who is there to stand with you? Coyotes drop out of the sky all the time, right? You never know what's coming in the week ahead. Coyotes come all the time. Who's coming alongside you to stand with you, to walk with you? Take it one step further. Let me ask you this. Are you really growing in your faith, in love and good deeds, as, as it says here in Hebrews, why we spur one another on to love and good deeds? And can you actually grow in your faith if you're not connected in meaningful ways with other followers of Jesus? And I'm convinced you really can't. I think you can go so far. I think you can get to a point, but you're going to get stuck because you need the other people to be there with you, to, to work things out, to work our faith out together. Uh, we had a dean of chapel at Asbury Seminary. His name was J.D. Wall, John David Wall. He said this once. He said, most people get stuck in their faith because they are isolated, thinking and believing that they don't need others to grow he says, just me and Jesus, and they're not in meaningful relationship where faith is being worked out, right? He says, we're just, we just need each other where we work out our faith, where faith is being worked out. Yeah, faith is personal. It's very personal. We have to own it, but it was never meant to be private, just be kept to ourselves, right? We've said this before. Because our faith is formed, our faith gets worked out in community, in relationship with one another. 
Friends, that's why, that's why our small groups matter that we do. That's why Sunday school matters. That's why the Bible studies that we have uh, throughout the week that meet here, that's why those things matter. That's why we do this stuff together. You know, one reason uh, we offer Stephen Ministries, and uh, I think there's a, a note even in your uh, bulletin about it today, is because sometimes when we're going through stuff, we just need someone to walk with us, right? We need someone to join us in that, to encourage us, to speak words of hope to us. That's why Stephen Ministry is such a valuable ministry here. Because we have folks that come alongside people and do that with them. Um, and so maybe you're wondering, this sound, again, this sounds great. You paint a great picture. But why, why don't we see this kind of community in the church all the time? Because sometimes we don't see it. Um, but let's be real. It's not always as simple as we'd like it to be. It's not automatic. It's not guaranteed. It's not always neat and tidy. Uh, the reality is this community is complex, right? Because the truth about all community and whether that's sacred or secular in the church is that it consists of people and we are flawed, right? Don't believe me? Just Go look in the mirror. <laughs> I see it every day, looking right back at me. You know, I know I'm flawed. I know I need other people to speak those words into my life. Uh, that's why I value this group of, there was a group of five of us that we meet every Monday. Um, you know, we're in Cincinnati. We're in Dayton. We're, we're up here. We're all different parts of the state. But we get together, and I need those guys in my life. Um, because sometimes I see the flaws, and they see Jesus in me. Make sense? And that happens to us sometimes. We, we end up uh, just looking at ourselves, and we need someone else to encourage us and say, no, you need to know who Jesus is in you. That's who you are. Live into that person. So I need those guys to do that. Will we eventually let one another down? Maybe, probably. I mean, again, we're flawed. There, there could be times if we pursue this, if we really give ourselves to pursuing this, there might be confusion, there might be frustration, even disappointment. But I had a friend that said this once. He said this. He said, while the abundant life is difficult to find in community, he says it's impossible to find outside of it. I think he got it right. Yeah, is it hard? Yeah, it can be, but we can't find it outside of a community. We need that. Because here's what I know. We learn to love how? By loving. How do we learn how to forgive? By forgiving. How do we learn to serve? By serving. Sometimes you just have to risk being known in order to risk being loved. It's the way it works. So why church? Why do we do church? Why are we called to do this? Well, there's an author um, Amy and I have read. His name's James Bryan Smith. He's got a book called The Good and Beautiful Community. Isn't that a great title for the church? The Good and Beautiful Community. I love that picture, that image. It says, group of people committed to following the Spirit of God, extending grace to one another, and then demonstrating love. You know, we really do need each other. We need one another. We need to be committed to God. We need to be committed to each other. And as we do that, that will unharness the potential that God has stored up, that God has planned for this congregation. That's how we unlock it, by doing this together. So, kind of wrap up. Where do we go from here? Where do we go as we go out? That's the key, right? What do we do with this? Another author, and I don't know who wrote this. I can't give him credit. But he said, it's unlikely that we will deepen our relationship with God in a casual or haphazard manner. There will be a need for some intentional commitment and some reorganization in our lives. But there is nothing that will enrich our lives more. As I read that, I think it was Dallas Willard that wrote that, as I think. 
uh, it came back surprising I quote Dallas Willard, I know. But, <laughs> but here's the takeaway for me is that we have to make a decision to pursue that kind of connection with others. We have to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a step. And I'm going to do this. Um, how do we do it? There in the back on, on the table is a list of some of our groups. You could get plugged into one of our small groups that meets. Uh, if one of those doesn't work for you, what do you do? Well, it's not difficult. It really isn't difficult to do this. You just start by saying, who's currently in my circle of friends? That's your group that you start with. It's really that easy. You just get them together. You get folks together once a week, every other week, once a month, whatever works for you. And friends, you take a chance, right? And you talk about your faith. You ask questions like, where are you struggling with your faith right now? You ask questions like, where are you growing in your faith? What challenged you this past week? What was a blessing in your life this week that you just want to share and celebrate? And you just talk about stuff like that. Because again, we only learn to talk about our faith with other people by how? By actually doing it, right? That's how we learn. We have to just start doing it. You don't have to have it all figured out. I know there's a thought, well, I don't have a Bible degree. I don't have a theology degree. You don't need one. Right? You just need a commitment. You need a group of people that are committed together that really want to grow to know Jesus more. And then you just do it. You just get together and you do it. You do it over lunch. You do it over breakfast. You get together in someone's house. Call us. We'll give you a room here at the church you can meet in if it's not already used. But far too long, though, we've been stuck in our faith because we just rely on the church to program everything for us. And we do that. That's good, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But that limits our potential because we can't program everything. Sometimes we just have to do it on our own. We just have to take a step and be risk takers and do this, right? But nothing will enrich your life more. I promise you, nothing will enrich your life more. Again, it'll be hard at times but nothing better because when the coyotes come and friends, they're going to come. Who's standing beside you in the field? Who's there for you? Last thing, real quick. If you want an easy way to do this, if you're really committed to it, we all have these little mini computers in our hands now. <laughs> if, you, if you load the Bible app from version, I did this this morning. I went into search, I put community, and I have a whole list of plans, of reading plans for doing community together. The power of community in life's difficult season, the power of community to heal trauma, uh, loving your community, seven-day devotional, irresistible community, godly community. Uh, it just goes on and on. These are right here for you. You just grab one of these, you hit it, it starts for you each day. It gives you a reading, a prayer. You can just do this together. It's really that simple. Oh, this has made it so easy to do stuff. Um, so that's one option, one way you can do this together. But I think it's important for us as a church, if we're going to grow as a body, that we need to be in this together. Amen? Coyotes are coming. They're coming. I hope you don't get any this week. <laughs> but who's standing with you? Who's your community that you're a part of that's with you in this? We need that, don't we? I need that. You need that. I need you. You need me. We need each other. So let's do this together. Amen? Let's do this together. Let me pray for us, uh, then we'll sing our closing song. God, I thank you for the great gift of community that you've given to us by placing your very image within us. God, we look at you. You're the perfect embodiment of what community looks like. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living together in perfect unity, in harmony all the time. And God, we know that we're broken, that we're flawed, that we bring sin and, and sometimes selfishness and things into our relationships. But God, we know that you have the power to work in us, to heal that, and through that, to grow us 
into more loving, more caring people for the sake of your kingdom, the sake for each other. And so God, my prayer is that you would work in us, in this congregation, to grow us together as your community, your, your community here at Perrysburg First. God, let us come alongside, spur one another on, encourage one another more each and every day to love and good deeds. So God, come, meet us now, do that work within us. Grow us to love you more and love each other more. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 I invite you to stand for our, our closing hymn today. So I invite you to uh, receive the, the blessing today, the benediction as you go. So now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, make you complete, make you whole. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen? Amen. 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 Go this week in the peace in Christ, and we'll see you. I'll see you in two weeks, but have a great week.